Um, this is a, a fairly lengthy uh, webinar with a lot of questions, so we're going to start uh, get started right away. As uh, Mark mentioned, uh, hand is about six percent of the uh, uh, six percent of the questions that the uh, from the OITE, according to the AO ABOS data, and fifty percent of the questions come from the top twelve uh, topics listed, and eighty percent of the questions that you will see come from the top thirty-five topics. We have reviewed uh, the questions uh, from the last eight OITEs and uh, have broke them down accordingly and we'll go over questions based on how much frequency they've appeared uh, on the last eight years uh, in the OITE. So let's start. Uh, first question, which of the following digit amputations may be considered a relative contraindication for a replantation? Now I know many of you have taken these tests already, but so let's review some of these answers. So what do you need to know to get this question right? Uh, you need to be familiar with the indications for replantation, and they're pretty straightforward. Thumb, multiple digits, any part in the child, wrist or forearm, elbow or above the elbow, so a limb amputation, and an individual uh, amputation distal to FDS. Uh, these are all where a replantation should be attempted. May not be successful, but should be attempted. Contraindications are a mangled extremity, multiple uh, or segmental injury, other uh, medical comorbidities, prolonged ischemia time of greater than six hours in a limb, a self-inflicted wound, a mentally unstable patient, and a single digit proximal to FDS is a relative contraindication. So a zone two amputation uh, should uh, not be considered for replantation because it results in a poor PIP function because of it, it's in zone two. So the answer to this question is a ring finger amputation through the proximal phalanx shaft, which is a zone two amputation, and that's a relative contraindication for replantation. So 90% of you got that question right. Next question. All of the following factors are favorable for digit survival after replant, uh, replantation uh, surgery except So, so uh, why do replants fail? This is important information. Uh, usually within the first 12 hours, uh, it's because of arterial thrombosis. And beyond that, it's venous uh, congestion. And after about a week, if a replant fails, uh, it's uh, usually because of an infection. Uh, many studies have showed that the type of injury was the main determinant for whether you would be successful in replanting a digit. The worst outcome was seen in extensively crushed digits followed by degloving or a ring avulsion type injuries, cigarette smoking in patients, prolonged ischemia time. The best outcomes were seen in sharp amputations, female gender, gender age under 13, and non-smokers. So the factors that are favorable for digit survival after replant surgery, given the, the answers, the best answer is a, uh, so the, uh, sorry, digit survival after replantation surgery except so all of those there are favorable for success except for a crushed amputated digit, and 99% of you got that question right. Next, the 34-year-old male sustains amputations of the fourth and fifth fingers at the level of the middle phalanx after cutting them with a butcher knife. Which of the following techniques would most likely increase total surgical time during replantation? To get this question right, you should be familiar with the sequence of replantation and how you can uh, be most efficient in the replant process. Uh, surgical time is increased by digit to digit uh, re uh, repair versus uh, stru structure to structure repair. So if you replant a digit and fix all the structures at one time and then go on to the next digit, that's going to increase your surgical time and can actually uh, reduce your success in replantation. So structure by structure repair is the most efficient, and that means if you have multiple digits, fix all the bone first, then your tendons, then your arteries, then your nerves and veins for the multiple digits. That will reduce your surgical time. Anytime you have a major limb amputation, you actually need to restore uh, blood flow first because you have a very limited ischemia time. For a digit, your ischemia time is relatively longer, uh, so you, can, you have time to do fix the other structures. But for a limb, you need to restore uh, blood flow, so often you need to do the artery first. Sometimes you need to shunt, and remember to do fasciotomies. Uh, 
because of reperfusion uh, sy uh, syndrome and compartment syndrome is frequent after limb replantation. So in this question, this gentleman cut off his two digits and uh, is, that's an indication for replantation, multiple digits. So what would increase total surgical time? And the answer is digit by digit repair method. So the most efficient way is structure by structure repair method. So 82% of you got this right. Uh, the other answer that was changed, uh, uh, um, uh, the other answers are just not efficient, uh, are, are more efficient than a digit by digit repair. Next, the 34 year old male undergoes thumb replantation after an, an industrial meat slicer accident. At four hours postoperatively, there's a drop from 33 degrees Celsius to 29 degrees Celsius, and the pulse oximetry monitor on the thumb reads 87%. All of the following are treatment options for the management arterial, for arterial inflow insufficiency except. So some key points in this question is that at four hours, as mentioned in the previous slide, uh, when you lose, when you, your replant starts to fail is likely an arterial problem, an arterial insufficiency. For if it's after 12 hours, it's usually a venous congestion problem. So this is four hours, the temperature has dropped. So a good way to monitor replants is temperature and uh, there's a drop in the temperature, so that's suggesting that your uh, replant is going south. So what is, what is the best ways to manage arterial insufficiency? You can, in the first 12 hours, uh, it's usually an arterial thrombosis. You can place the limb in a dependent position, loosen any uh, construct, constrictive dressings. You can get a tight dressing that uh, interferes with uh, arterial supply. Uh, you can try IV heparin a warm room uh, to prevent vasoconstriction. You can try stellate blocks. And if that doesn't work, you often need to go back to the OR if your replant fails early. For venous congestion, uh, leeches are often used. Uh, and remember to use prophylactic antibiotics, such as air, uh, uh, to cover Aeromonas hydrophilia, which is uh, uh, the organism that uh, uh, you can get an infection from, from leeches. So the answer to this question as to uh, how to address this is uh, all of those answers there are to address arterial insufficiency except question three, which is to address venous congestion. So, so the next topic uh, that is frequently asked is RSD, or complex regional pain syndrome. And this is, uh, we will go ahead and cover a few questions here. All of the following are clinical features of complex regional pain syndrome, or RSD of the lower extremity except, so uh, many of those terms should be familiar uh, to you all. Now remember uh, what uh, complex regional pain syndrome is. It's a sympathetic activity uh, in, after an initial uh, trauma or painful event. The most common signs are exaggerated pain, swelling, stiffness, shiny skin, any skin uh, temperature changes, and, and excessive sweating or hyperhidrosis. So there's two types of complex regional pain syndrome you should be familiar with. Type 1, also known uh, in the old uh, nomenclature as RSD, is when there's no known nerve lesion. And type 2, uh, which is causalgia because it's caused by uh, an injury to a nerve. And there's a sort of a staging of RSD, an acute, subacute, and chronic stages. Uh, and I'm sure by this point many of you have, have seen uh, this condition. So going back to this question, what are features of complex regional uh, pain syndrome, all of these except, remember to read the question carefully and look for those words such as uh, except. Uh, the answer here is crepitus. Uh, that's not usually a, a finding in, in complex regional pain syndrome, but all the other choices are, uh, are correct. Next, a 52-year-old woman falls stepping off an escalator and sustains the wrist fracture shown in figures A and B. Post-reduction radiographs demonstrate 20 degrees of dorsal angulation. This decision is made to proceed with open reduction internal fixation with a volar plate. Which of the following adjuvant interventions has been shown to improve outcomes? This actually uh, has been in the literature more recently. And uh, what uh, the, if you read the questions, uh, they're a little bit um, uh, unclear what they're getting to. Uh, but uh, there is a, one right answer here. Um, Recent studies have shown uh, that vitamin C decreases the incidence of complex regional pain syndrome after uh, distal radius fractures. Uh, there was a prospective trial uh, in 2002 
that showed a significant decrease in, in, in complex regional pain syndrome with, with vitamin C use. How does it work? It reduces uh, free oxygen radicals and uh, protects the capillary endothelium and somehow uh, prevents the uh, this, this uh, signs and symptoms uh, of complex pain syndrome. So in this uh, situation, the, in this question, the answer, best answer was administration of oral vitamin C beginning the first day after surgery. Um, the other uh, answers uh, may uh, be, be right to some degree, but the best answer is oral vitamin C. Uh, the others are, are a little uh, more nebulous in terms of how they're benefiting the patient. Next question, uh, which of the following modalities has been shown to have a positive effect when treating early stages of complex regional pain syndrome? Uh, again, this is a, an important topic to understand. Uh, you, uh, how do you prevent pain, uh, complex regional pain syndrome in not only uh, in the early stages, but when it's first recognized? The primary goals are to decrease pain and prevent stiffness. Uh, early immobilization is, is, is important but it, you don't want it to have too much uh, immobilization or prolonged immobilization because that can result in uh, a significant stiffness. If you do aggressive passive range of motion early on uh, during the inflammatory stages of healing, uh, you uh, may provoke and actually start the cycle and increase the sympathetic response and vessel spasm that results in a complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, the, Contracts, baths may be used to desensitize and improve the blood flow. There's TENS units. Therapy is very critical for complex regional pain syndrome when it's identified. You want to break the sympathetic response. Uh, stellate blocks are frequently helpful when it's combined with a therapy for range of motion, but the very early stages, uh, aggressive passive motion can actually uh, uh, make the complex regional pain syndrome worse. So for this, the best, the following modalities that have been shown to have a positive effect when treating early stages of complex regional pain syndrome, the best answer in is immobilization. The others have been used or can, been, can be used, but they uh, don't have any uh, defined scientific benefit. The first answer, passive range of motion exercise can actually exacerbate complex regional pain syndrome. Next question. Level 1 evidence has shown vitamin C reduces the insects in, incidence of uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome in patients with which of the following? Uh, we went over this question in a previous slide, and uh, there's a significant evidence that uh, vitamin C administration lowers the risk of complex pain syndrome after distal radius fractures, um, and the academy guidelines for distal radius fractures actually have recommended the use of vitamin C in distal radius fractures, particularly in the geriatric population. The strength of the studies have been considered uh, moderate. So for this question, uh, the answer is distal radius fractures. I'm going to take a little... Uh, Okay, next question is on scaphoid fractures. <clears throat> so, this uh, this topic uh, this uh, era, this topic was uh, question. There were eight questions in the last eight years, uh, so it's a very common topic. A 27-year-old professional cowboy is thrown from a bull during the rodeo and lands on his hand. No deformity is identified, and the hand is completely neurovascular intact. Pain is present upon palp palpation of the anatomic snuff box. A radiograph is provided. The cowboy wants to return to competitive riding tomorrow. Which of the following is the best step, uh, next step in management? So you see you have uh, somewhat of a navicular view and uh, your treatment options. So for scaphoid fractures, it's important that if there's any anatomic snuff box tenderness uh, and you have a high index of suspicion, you should treat these fractures or treat these injuries as fractures until proven otherwise. So wrist trauma and tenderness, particularly in the anatomic snuff box, scaphoid tubercle tenderness is very reliable indicator of a possible occult fracture. 
pain with resisted pronation, uh, AP lateral oblique and scaphoid views are critical. And scaphoid, uh, if you, uh, the scaphoid view is the most important in, for plain radiographs. X-rays are only 65% sensitive uh, on initial films. Um, and remember, the scaphoid view is with 30 degrees of wrist extension and 20 degrees of ulnar deviation. If an X-ray is negative in a patient with snuff box tenderness, what do you do? Your options are to immobilize them until they come back with repeat, uh, for repeat X-rays at about two to three weeks and repeat examination. But if you need an immediate diagnosis, MRI is the best test. It has the highest sensitivity and specificity, particularly for occult, occult fractures. You can actually see this uh, on the image that there. There's an occult fracture of the waist of the scaphoid. CT is a good alternative, but it's better for uh, confirming scaphoid healing. And also, uh, it's the best test uh, to determine displacement. Bone scans are useful and were, have been used in the past. Uh, but they're only uh, positive at about 72 hours, so you can have a delay uh, in diagnosis. So the best uh, answer for this uh, situation is he has anatomic snuff box. His initial x-ray was negative, and so, but, so you have to treat him that he has a scaphoid fracture until proven otherwise. So which is the following is the best step, next step in management? He's a professional athlete. Although I question professional rodeo, but I'm sure I'll get some criticism for saying that, um, particularly maybe from Steve in Canada. But uh, the best exam and to quickly give you your diagnosis is the wrist MRI. And that's response three. Eighty-six percent of you got that right. Um, Twelve percent of you uh, answered uh, percutaneous screw fixation. Uh, that is a very reasonable treatment option. Uh, but you should first confirm the diagnosis, and on the initial x-ray, uh, the fracture was not evident. Next, the 35-year-old woman reports wrist pain uh, after a fall onto his outstretched hand. On exam, she has focal tenderness over the wrist snuff box. A radiograph and CT image are shown in figure A and B. What is the proper treatment for her image, uh, for her injury? So you can see on her x-rays, what do you have to pick up? Uh, there's an obvious fracture of the scaphoid navicular. And then uh, there's, if you look at the image, uh, the image on the bottom, uh, there's a humpback deformity. So there's displacement of the scaphoid. So that's the key point you need to pick up on these radiographs. So a displaced scaphoid fracture, you should be familiar with how to treat those injuries. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to turn off my phone in just a minute here. Um, so if you have a non-displaced uh, fracture, you have the option to treat these non-operatively. Um, if they involves the waist or a tuberosity, a short arm thumb spike, a cast, uh, in the distal third, uh, you can immobilize for two months. For the mid-waist, three to four months, and the proximal third, four to five months. So these are for non-operative treatment of scaphoid non-displaced fractures. The more distal they are, the better blood supply they have, the faster they healed. Uh, the more proximal they are, the more there is chance for avascular necrosis, and they will not heal. And actually, casting a proximal third scaphoid fracture is really not done nowadays, except in the very young, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Long arm versus short arm casting is controversial. The most common error is discontinuing casting too soon. That can frequently lead to non-unions. So when do you operate on a scaphoid? When there's any displacement, so greater than one millimeter, any proximal pole fracture. So you really shouldn't treat a proximal pole fracture non-operatively. And any angulation, those are three reasons to operate on a, distal, on a scaphoid fracture. Sorry. And indications for headless compression screws, and that's how we treat most of these. Any proximal pole scaphoid, a displaced or unstable fracture, delayed presentation, associated injuries such as a distal radius or perilunate injury, non-displaced fractures, and high demand activity and high demand uh, uh, people. So any professional athlete or high-level athlete with a non-displaced fracture, you may want to treat them with percutaneous screw fixation. So for this, the answer should be open reduction in internal fixation. 98% of you got this right. So 
Next question. A 22-year-old male snowboarder falls on an outstretched hand and presents with the radiograph shown. Which of the following techniques is most important in optimizing biomechanical fixation? So it's a waist scaphoid fracture. Uh, it may be displaced. It's hard to say. Sometimes a CT scan is essential to confirm that. A CT scan is also helpful in determining humpback deformity. So what they're asking you is what's the best place to put your screw? Um, biomechanical studies have shown that the longer, the, the, a longer screw placed in the central axis of the scaphoid is the best in terms of biomechanical fixation and, to, and allows you to optimize healing potential. There have been several studies that have shown that and there's a multitude of store, uh, studies uh, that, you, um, uh, that you can use uh, by different companies but they all uh, allow for compression across the fracture site. So going back to the question, uh, this is a snowboarder who falls, has a scaphoid fracture. Uh, what's the best treatment options? It looks like it's a little displaced, so you probably want to fix it. ORF is uh, the best thing. Um, so you can do a lot of times if they're not displaced percutaneously or a mini open procedure. Uh, and the answer for this is a longer screw placed in the central axis of the scaphoid. 45% uh, of you got that right. Um, uh, larger screws uh, are, can be used, but there are problems with larger screws in that if you have a non-union, it's hard to convert those and get fixation of, of non-united fractures. It's more important to use a longer screw in the central axis, uh, axis of the scaphoid as opposed to a larger screw, a larger short screw. So in this circumstance, length is important. 